Garden Club. Hence the name Nature Garden Club. That's why we're doing something about nature today. Uh, welcome to everyone who's visiting, uh, members, and maybe potentially new members. I'm Eileen Smith, and I chair the Garden Club along with Darlene LaBelle. Darlene is <coughs> unable to be here today. And Dee Ream, over there, is our treasurer. And she is, will be taking dues after the meeting if there's anybody who hasn't paid their dues or who would like to join the meeting. And that'll be over in that little table over in the corner. Um, if you would like, you may stay after the presentation and we will have a short meeting. And uh, on the table are uh, calendars that for this particular season, and um, that might interest you as well. So you're welcome to one of those. Today, our hostesses are Diane Stanley and Dee Reed, both over there. And Diane will introduce our speaker. Well, first of all, I'd like to say it's nice to see a lot of faces coming back from up north, and um, I appreciate you all coming here today. Our guest speaker, Greg Drabo, is an avid photographer who is still learning to be a better birder. With his limited eyesight, learning how to identify and find birds by their sound has made photographing them much easier. In his brief birding journey, he has had the pleasure of seeing almost 800 different species of birds. While living in Legacy these past two years, Greg has found about 90 different species of birds, oh, wow. with 68 of those right in his backyard, which he refers to as the Honeymoon National Park. Please welcome <laughs> Greg Drabo. Thank you, and uh, thank you everybody for being here and inviting me here. You might be wondering, they gave me an introduction of why you got a bird guy here in a garden club. Well, I'll just put it this way. Uh, if you build it, they will come. And in my two years that my wife and I have lived here inside Legacy, I've completely ripped out all the existing landscaping in our yard and started over. Uh, it's paid lots of dividends. I can't promise the same dividends for somebody else, but it has paid dividends. Uh, I continue to see birds that I never thought I would see here. And within the last week, I've had four or five new birds in my yard that I've never seen inside Legacy. So um, things are moving. And like I said, if you build it, they will come. Um, I've got a presentation to show you. All the images were taken by myself. And I can tell you that at least half of the image, images in this presentation were taken right inside Legacy. So. I'll point some of them out. Uh, I'll answer questions at the end. I can do some questions in between, but uh, let's get rolling. So that picture there is taken inside Legacy. It's at the end of Stony Brook, one of my favorite places to catch things. And I'll tie it together. That is a myrtle warbler. Why is it called a myrtle warbler? It's not named after a woman. It's actually <laughs> named after a wax myrtle plant, which it's sitting on because it likes to eat the wax berries of a wax myrtle. So there you go, everything tied together in one slide. Presentation over, have a great day. <laughs> <laughs> I've broken it down into different sections, but we're gonna cover the birds that you're most likely to see on a daily basis. Another picture taken just behind Stony Brook. Uh, everybody knows we have resident bald eagles in the neighborhood. Uh, there's usually a pair of them. As a matter of fact, there's usually a pair of them sitting right up on the top of the power line there. And what's interesting is any movie you watch and they show you a picture of a bald eagle, they don't use the sound from a bald eagle. That's what a bald eagle sounds like. Very high-pitched chirp. If you recognize the sound, you know the eagles are on the light pole. American goldfinch. Yes, we have goldfinches here. For those of us who have lived up north, we're used to seeing these birds year-round. We only have them here in Legacy in the winter. Very pretty sound. 
very easy to tell if you're in garden. They're always happy. Always, always a happy sound. Um, another bird that's here year-round, and once you hear them, they're easy to spot by the sound. Uh, we do have kestrels. Another picture taken behind Stony Brook. Imagine if you think about it, a few of you have probably heard this sound and go, that's kind of a crazy sound. I wonder what that bird is. It's a kestrel. There's usually a couple kestrels hanging around. Uh, they like to perch on high things. They'll perch on the power lines up here, or they'll perch on a, on a snag somewhere. They'll sit up high waiting for a victim. So a kestrel is a falcon. It's actually the smallest falcon in North America. Uh, robins. We have robins here, only in the wintertime. They like to eat fruit. Um, unfortunately, that's a picture taken in my uh, front yard in Minnesota. That's a uh, mountain ash tree, which you're not going to find in Florida. But they do come here, and they love the berries on the Yopon holly. And if you hear that sound, and usually where there's one robin, there's more than one robin. And I've seen them in flocks of up to 25 in the backyard. So usually if there's one, there's more than one to look at. Blue jays. No, this picture was not taken inside Legacy. <laughs> <laughs> Blue Jays, uh, love them or hate them, have all kinds of sounds. Uh, that's one of about a hundred different sounds that they make. Um, and that's the one you normally hear. Mm -hmm. They love to impersonate hawks. And I've heard them here in Legacy, and they'll impersonate a red-shouldered hawk. They'll fool me once in a while, but they never fool the other, the other birds. All right, this is going to be one that might be hard to hear, so we can crank it up if you can't hear it. This is a bird here that's you're around, and it makes a very distinctive sound. And I'm sure you've all heard the sound, but you usually can't see the bird, and you go, I wonder what makes that sound? Just a little peening sound. And usually they, it comes from a bush or a tree, and you walk by it and you hear the soft, faint peening sound. And that's this little blue gray gnat catcher. And it's a little nervous bird that never stops moving around. It's like it's on crack, and it never stops moving, but it makes that sound. And it's here year round. Brown Thrasher. Brown Thrasher is in the mockingbird family, so it's related to the mockingbird. It's also related to the catbird. And we see these all the time in the spring. And then this time of year, they all but vanish, but they're still here. So if you know what they sound like, you can find them, but they're not gonna be visible this time of year. And this is actually one in my backyard here in Legacy on my redbud tree that we just lost. And he would come up there in the spring mornings and sing for us. But they make this crazy smacking sound. And that's the sound you're gonna hear this time of year. And it'll be coming from a shrub, a hedge, or a bush somewhere down low. And you hear this crazy smell. They also make a hissing sound that almost sounds like a cat hissing. And I, have, I couldn't find a recording of a hiss, but it makes a hiss. You'll hear the hiss, and you'll hear this clicking sound this time of year. But it's a fairly large bird, and it's about the size of a mockingbird. Very pretty. We have Carolina chickadees here year round. For whatever reason, sometimes they like to show themselves and sometimes they don't. But it's the one bird that'll tell you what it is. Chickadee dee dee dee, chickadee dee dee, chickadee dee dee. <laughs> Carolina wrens are here year round. They make all kinds of crazy sounds. There is no bird that makes more sound for their size than a Carolina wren. They make Unbelievable crazy, and they are loud. This is what I call their car alarm call. That's Carolina Wren. Most wrens are very vocal, and this one makes more sound than any other bird in size that I'm aware of. Cedar waxwings. Uh, we have large flocks of cedar waxwings here in the fall and into the winter. And they're after the same thing the robins are after. They're after the berries on the Yopon holly 
and the other holly trees so they're looking for ripe fruit and when there's one there's more than one and i had in our backyard one evening i think i posted a picture i had seventy of these in the tree so when there's one there's a bunch of them and they make they make a very distinctive soft sound and if you hear the sound you can usually hear it much earlier than you can find the bird it's a high-pitched buzzing sound and that's the only call that they make and if you walking around and you hear this high-pitched buzz it's the cedar wax works and they're not here right yet but they should be here in the next i don't know month or so when they migrate down um, another very common bird not one you see real often but uh, we have two two doves that are in the area this is the ground dove And they can become almost annoying with the call and they <laughs> won't stop. Mm -hmm. Two kinds of crows. Believe it or not, there are two kinds of crows in the neighborhood. Um, we have the American crow, which everybody knows about, and everybody's seen. And the crows are kind of the defender of the territory, and they will run off other larger birds. <laughs> What's interesting though, if you hear a murder of crows raising a ruckus. Go outside because they found something. They found either an owl, a hawk, or an eagle. So usually they're telling you that, hey, everybody, look what we found. <laughs> and then they'll run them off. <laughs> now this is a fish crow. And visually, they're very difficult to tell apart by sight, but they sound very different. The difference is, is the fish crows will fly over in 50 or 70 um, count uh, formations flying over. They fly in large groups and they form large flocks. And they don't normally act like an American crow does. But the sound's very different. It's a very nasal, strange tone. So that's a fish crow. And they're only found around water. But we have both fish crows and American crows here. We have, what, four different woodpeckers that are in the neighborhood. This is the smallest woodpecker in North America. This is the downy. And uh, this is a female because she has no red on her. Um, and if you listen, they're all around. They make a very distinct call. Just a high-pitched chirp. One single note, high-pitched chirp. That's a male because he's got red on his head. But just a very high-pitched single chirp, and you'll hear him. Bluebirds. We're blessed. We have many, many bluebirds in here. Uh, they're easy to find once you know what they sound like. Uh, they also will nest if you put a nesting box up and you have the right habitat, open, grassy areas, they will nest in a nesting box. So we had uh, the nesting box in our backyard, we had at least two, if not three, birds of uh, bluebirds this year raised out of it. And that's their sound. This bird is a winter only visitor, and they have just moved back in in the last week. And it's another bird that will tell you its name. Am I wrong? It tells you its name. They are, they are a flycatcher, so they are an insect eater. So they're not going to come to your seed feeders, they're not going to come and visit, visit your garden looking for seeds, but they will come in your garden and look for insects and bugs because they are a flycatcher. Uh, possibly one of the most annoying birds that we have. <laughs> And if you've ever been to a parking lot of Publix or Winn-Dixie or anywhere, anywhere there's humans, you're going to find grackles. And there's actually two different kinds of grackles we have. So this is the boat tail grackle, and they can get big, long tails behind them. And the smaller grackles have a smaller tail, but they make different sounds. But like I said, I think this is possibly the most annoying bird that we have. But they are almost always found around humans. Without exception. 
And they're actually quite pretty because they're not black. They're, they're purple and blue. Uh, you gotta get them in the right light. But yes, they're annoying. So this is the common grackle, which looks similar, different size of tail. And that's a better picture. That's a wax myrtle, and that's down at the end of Stony Brook. A lot of the birds like the wax myrtle plant. That's kind of a multi-purpose plant for a lot of these birds. This is a spring and summer resident. Uh, this is another flycatcher. So when the great crested flycatchers leave and head south, the eastern phoebes move in. So the great crested flycatchers have all left. But when they come in the spring, they're easy to see here because they have a very distinct call. That's, that's the sound that they make. And that's, like I said, they're not here right now, but it's always fun in the spring because you know when they've arrived because they've announced their arrival and you know they're around. This is another uh, winter only visitor. Uh, it likes to hide in the bushes. And I'll give you a key if you want to have them in your yard, uh, plant beautyberry. Uh, that's one of the things that they really like. They like beautyberry. And why are they call catbirds? Because they meow. <laughs> and they actually, they're all marked the same, and they actually have an interesting kind of a rusty orange uh, color on their backside. Right? They're all marked the same way, but it's really hard to see the backside unless it's perched for you, and wanting to show off the south end. <laughs> is another call that the great catbird will make. Bonus points for anybody other than Pat Summers that can tell me what that tree is. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's a Brazilian pepper, which they love. And they eat it and distribute it, and that's a very invasive, very bad plant that none of us want around. Sorry, Pat, but I knew you knew that one. But that's, that's not a plant we want around, but that's why you don't want it around, is because they'll come in and feed off of it, carry the seed, disperse the seed, and now you got a big problem. All right, the assassin. That's what it is. That's, that's literally who we call the assassin. And yes, we have Cooper's hawks in here. They're not real common, but they're around. The other birds know them. Uh, they do make a call. And yeah, they are without And that's the call they make. It's kind of like the Joker, cackling at you before it kills you. And now the last image was taken in our backyard here in Legacy. That was taken in Minnesota. This is the most common hawk that we have here. This is the hawk that we, normally if you see a hawk, you're going to see a red-shouldered hawk by far the most common uh, hawk of all of them, and they make lots of crazy sounds. Yeah, yeah and they make the sound all the day, all day long, whenever they're flying, whenever they're around, there's no mistake there's a red-shouldered hawk in the area. We have, actually, we have house finches here that move around. We had about a dozen in my yard for about a month, and now they're gone, and now I see them once in a while. But another finch that we do have, and they do make an interesting sound. Another happy sound. Most, most finches are happy. That is, unless the assassins are around. <laughs> uh, the house wrens have moved back in. Uh, they're here in the winter time only. And in the last week or so, the house wrens have arrived and they make a very unique sound. If you think, and if you listened outside in the last week, you've probably heard this sound because they've just arrived and you know they're here. And like most wrens, including the Carolina wren, you can usually tell it's a wren because the tail sticks straight up. Morning doves, we have no shortage of morning doves. <laughs> Pretty birds. Some people
people will confuse that with an owl, but it's not not an owl. That's that's the morning dove call. Uh, the bird that I started off with, the marital warbler. Um, they have not arrived yet. Uh, they will be here shortly and then here through the winter. Um, the bird has another nickname that we like to call it. It's known as the butterbutt. <laughs> its official name is also a yellow rumped warbler and it has a yellow patch on its backside. So it looks like a dab of butter on its on its hindquarters, so we call them butter butts. This is one that just had a bath in our backyard. Everybody knows the cardinal, they make a couple of really distinct sounds. We have them here year round. Uh, for some reason, the cardinals in our area are exceptionally tame. Other areas I've lived, you can't get near them. And for some reason around here, they don't seem to care. That's usually the spring sound or the spring call that they make. You might hear it once in a while this time of year, but it's usually what they're making in the springtime. This is the sound you usually hear is this clicking sound. And yes, that is a cardinal, that is the female. The females are brown, the males are red, uh, the juveniles are all brown, if you ever see one, but the juveniles will have a black bill. Mockingbird. Bullies, bullies of the neighborhood, but they're, they're funny. One of only about a thousand different sounds that they make. Um, this one's over in Pear Park, and that's on Beautyberry. And I will make my plug once again for Beautyberry. If you want to see birds in your yard, Plant Beautyberry, that's one of their absolute favorites when it's right. That's another other sound that they make. And like I said, I could play different mockingbird sounds here for the whole afternoon, because there's no shortage of them. This is a spring and summer bird. This is a very small warbler. And to be honest, most people will never see one because they like to hide in the trees. Fortunately for us, they also like water. So they'll come down to the water and make themselves um, available, but normally you're just gonna hear them. It's kind of a zipper sound if you think about it. Kind of a trailing zipper noise. But these will make this sound from the trees. Um, I'd say 99% of them have left for the winter, but in the spring and summertime, they're all over here, all over. This is a winter only bird. They've only, they've arrived in the last week or two. And this bird is easy to see because it constantly pumps its tail. So if you see a little small bird hopping around and its tail is going up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down, it's a palm warbler. And they don't, I've never heard one sing here. They just make this little chirp sound. The pterodactyl. Um, we have pterodactyls. I'm sorry, pileated or pileated woodpecker. We have we have them here. Um, we have one out back uh, along Entry Trail. That's out out there almost every single day. For a bird the size that it is, it's pretty shy. They don't like people. I had one almost land on me one day because he wasn't <laughs> expecting me to be out where I was at, and he literally flew right by me and landed on the uh, snag and looked over at me. And I looked at him, and he goes. Who are you? <laughs> it took off, and it's a it's a good sized bird. It's uh, um, I'll make a, a quick tangent here. Um, anybody that's read in the news, there's been a lot of articles about the ivory-billed woodpecker that has been extinct, supposedly for the last close to a hundred years. Ivory-billed woodpecker is even bigger than a pileated woodpecker, and they look similar, except it's got an ivory-colored bill. And the last ones that were left and seen in the wild were in this very remote area of Louisiana. But 150 years ago, Lake County was home to ivory billed woodpeckers. They lived here. They lived all over this part of Florida. So if you see an article about ivory billed woodpeckers, just think, well, 150 years ago, they were here. But of 
course, they're not any longer. And of course, the chances is anybody seen one, probably not real good. But anyway, that's my tangent. No mistake in their call. There's nothing else that sounds like that. And they'll also make the drumming sound. So we have the drumming sound, and it's pounding on the tree, as well as making the call. And that's a, that's a male, and most of the woodpeckers are easy to tell between the males and the females. He's got a red stripe by his mouth, so he's a male because he has the red stripe. If it was a female, it would not have that red stripe. Probably the most vocal woodpecker inside of my legacy is the red-bellied. It's not a red-headed, it's got a red belly, and it does actually have a red belly, that's hard to see, but this is a red-bellied woodpecker. And everybody's heard that sound, because that's the sound you hear in the neighborhood all the time. This is an interesting one, because he gra grabbed, I'm sorry, it's a she, it's a female, a brown anole lizard, which it's holding in its mouth, and it's smashing the lizard against the tree to kill it so it can eat it. And I've never seen a woodpecker ever do that, and that happened in our backyard. But that's actually a, a brown anole lizard. It's pounding the living daylights out of it. We do have hummingbirds here. Uh, at the moment, I haven't seen one for probably six or eight weeks, but they, uh, they're kind of fussy and finicky, and uh, but they will be here in the summertime. They'll be here in the wintertime, but I can't figure out the rhyme or reason. Uh, they like to follow what they like to eat. Uh, if you want to see hummingbirds in your yard, uh, plant firebush. That's my best advice. Firebush is a native plant for Florida, very low maintenance. Hummingbirds love it, and you don't have to worry about refilling the feeder when you got a firebush. And a firebush will bring in the hummingbirds. And they do make this clicking sound. So you can actually hear the wing beat and you can hear the clicking sound. But that clicking sound is a distinctive hummingbird sound. Probably one or of the two most common and most vocal birds that we have inside Legacy is the tufted titmouse. It also might be the cutest. <laughs> they're always talking, always singing, always around. They come to feeders. They're, they're like the perfect bird to have in your backyard. Because they're, for the most part, good guests. They're not obnoxious and they're adorable. And then here's the other call they make the Peter, 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 Peter. You hear this call, it's kind of haunting. It took me a while to figure out what it was, but this is their Peter Peter call. Shifting gears. Um, birds you're probably not gonna see in your backyard, unless you happen to live in one of our ponds. Yes, that's a white ibis. The white ibis are brown when they're juveniles. And they do eat fish, which really surprised me. I've never seen one eat a fish, and it's eating a fish right there. That's taken here in Legacy. That's over on Church Punt. Uh, everybody knows about the Anhingus we have here. Snake bird, it's actually a darter. So it's in the darter family, it's related to an African darter. But if you live in one of our ponds, you've heard this sound. The kingfisher has been gone all summer, and I heard him the other day, so he's back. And if you look really careful as you drive into our neighborhood here in the main entrance, and if you look over on the pond on the right-hand side of the road, if you look at the sign, that kingfisher will be on that sign almost half of the time when you drive by. That's where he lives. And he'll move around in the neighborhood, and I've seen him at different places, but 50-50 chance this time of year, if you look on the first pond when you come in, you'll see a kingfisher on one of those signs. And they make a very unique call. Don't forget that one when you hear it. And 
like I said, they've just come back for the for the winter months, and he'll be here all winter. Love him or hate him, we have whistling ducks. I love them. But I don't live in a pond, and I don't have a hundred of them. But I also don't feed a hundred of them in my pond. But I like the sound of them. That's another shot taken on a scrub jay trip. Uh, we do have common gallinules in here. There aren't a whole lot of them here, but they are here. And that's actually a juvenile. But a very, another, to me, a very Florida sound of being around water and hearing that common gallinule. They're also known as moorhead. Uh, great blue. We do have great blues. I will point out that a great blue is an <laughs> apex predator and it will eat anything it can swallow. Uh, I saw a picture once of one swallowing a rabbit and they'll swallow ducklings, they'll swallow goosling, goslings, uh, snakes, lizards, uh, rats, mice, fish, alligators. alligators yeah. If, if it can be swallowed, they'll eat it. Case in point. I haven't seen one for a while, but we do have green herons. Matter of fact, last winter there was at least three or four of them here. And this is one of the unusual poses where they'll raise their heads up. Other times they look like this. It's kind of a chicken cackle. Uh, we do have killdeer here. Uh, another distinctive sound, but there are killdeer I'd like to see. That's taken over in the villages, don't tell anybody. But... <laughs> uh, and the little blue heron, we have little blue herons. Actually, we have quite a few little blue herons. And actually, the little blue heron looks like this one. It's a juvenile. Little blue herons are white. Uh, from time to time, we'll have ospreys. Not real common, but in the wintertime, we'll see them around. This one was uh, trying to get, catch dinner over in uh, Fort DeSoto and missed. We have purple gallinules here. I have photographic evidence they're in Legacy. I've seen two of them here. I don't see them real often, but I've seen them around uh, Scrub J Trail. They are here. And they sound like baby's crying. If you want to see a purple gallinule, Go to Venetian Gardens in Leesburg. It is the purple gallinule capital of the entire world. There are more purple gallinules in that park than any other park in the entire world. These birds are not common, so if you go to a place and look for different Florida birds, if you see one or two purple gallinules, you're lucky. You can go to Venetian Gardens and see 25 of them. Uh, we do have these around. Uh, they will come to feeders. Very, very unique wetland sound. I know I'm around cattails when I hear that sound being made by Redmond Blackbirds. We have wood ducks in Legacy. Uh, I was very, very, very pleased to find them a little over a year ago, and I just saw them last week when I was out for a walk. I had six of them I found. And actually, Pat and I were out on a walk, and we found four of them on a pot on. Uh, uh, Scrub Jay Pond. And of course, as soon as they saw us, mm -hmm. they made this sound <laughs> and blasted out. And uh, I'm going to quote my friend in Minnesota. I apologize for the vulgarity. He refers to him as the oh shit bird. Because <laughs> that's the sound they're making. When they see you, they go oh shit and leave. <laughs> so he just calls them oh shits. Brian. But that's actually taken on the south side of the Scrub Jay Trail. So that's here in Legacy, and that's the place you're most likely to find them. So if you want to see a wood duck, bring some binoculars, and along the Scrub Jay is where you can find them. Now we're going to go on the ones that you don't see very often, but I wanted to include some of these because they're fun. Um, we have a bittern that lives here, I, I'm assuming year-round. Uh, I've only seen it twice. 
I know Trevor sees it once in a while out behind where he lives. It moves around, but it is the bird that can be standing literally in front of you and you can't see it. It is the master of camouflage and it just literally blends into wherever it's around. And that's the sound of it. And literally it can hide in plain sight. And I will give credit due when it's due. My wife Kay found that one, so I had to buy her ice cream that night because she found a good bird. <laughs> but you don't get to see it very often, but that, that bird is here. I've never heard it make that call, but that's the sound that it makes. <laughs> we have Baltimore Orioles. This time of year we'll pass through. I've had two in our yard. I've not seen one for a while. I thought I heard one today, but I didn't see it. Uh, I've not seen a pretty male like that, unfortunately. But usually it's this crazy chattering sound, which is what I heard today. And they like water. Unfortunately, that's my water feature in Minnesota. That's not the one here in Florida. They probably will never make that call here in Florida. They'll probably make that call only when they're up north for the summertime, which you might be lucky to hear that call. Um, this bird is year year round. It's hard to see. Uh, it likes to crawl up and down tree trunks, uh, but it has a very unique call. And I'll let you hear it and I'll tell you what it sounds like to me. How about a squeaky wheel bird wheel? <laughs> Another bird who gave me that. Of course, now that I know what a squeaky wilbur wheel sounds like, if I hear one, I know I've got a black or white warbler. <laughs> Another bird that we have here, uh, I almost guarantee you'll never see one. Uh, you can hear them, usually after dark, if you live around one of the wooden uh, perimeters of our development. And it'd be a very, very common bird to hear almost every evening in the summertime. I'll never hear one where we live down here on Honeymoon Avenue. But if you live, like I said, in the perimeter where it's wooded, you'll hear Chuck Will's widow. Definite sound of summer. But once again, it's habitat, and you're only going to hear that late, very late in the day, early in the evening. We are incredibly blessed to have nighthawks here every summer. They're gone, but we had at least three different nighthawk nests that I was aware of people tipped me off to and I photographed. This is actually in our neighbor's front yard. They build their nest in the rocks or they build it in your um, mulch and your planter and they'll raise one or two chicks and sit there motionless. It's not really a hawk because you look, it's got a teeny tiny beak and they eat insects. But the neat part is, is that they'll go out every evening right before sunset and fly around to feed and they make a very distinct call. I love hearing that call out in the evening and I know it's nighthawk time. And they'll fly around and they'll catch insects in midair. I mean, literally fly around and do acrobatics that you can't possibly imagine. If you've ever tried to follow one with a camera, it can become very frustrating because they can literally, pardon the pun, turn on a dime. I mean, they're unbelievable flyers. Uh, I actually had one of these in our backyard last week. This is another flycatcher uh, related to the Eastern Phoebe, but this is an Eastern Wood Peewee. And this one will tell you what it's called. Yeah, I had one in our backyard. I was very, very happy to have it in the backyard. Uh, we have European starlings here, which aren't a whole lot of fun, but uh, they're invasive. They don't belong here. Uh, if you want to see a European starling, look up on the power lines here either side of where the bald eagles are, and there's almost always a pair of European starlings. They're actually really pretty.
and they're usually around where people are around, and they usually like to hang out on power lines. And they're actually very pretty, but they're invasive, they don't belong here. I actually had one of these in our backyard last week for the first time. I'm blown away. Uh, Flicker is a woodpecker, so it is in the woodpecker family. Um, very unique call, very distinct, not very common around, not rare, but not common. And that's the only one I've ever seen here. It's a one note call. And that's, that's this past week in our backyard, right here. Very, very pretty, and that's a male. It's a male because he's got a mustache, the black stripe. <laughs> and I'm making it up, we've got the black stripe. The female will not have the black stripe. And that's actually a yellow shafted northern flicker because the, his feathers have yellow shafts. And there's actually a red shaft that you can see out west. Uh, I had one of these fly over our house the other night. Um, as a matter of fact, I saw him on the power line on the pole when I drove in here this morning. Um, they're not here all the time. They're about the same size as a bald eagle. But I had a picture of one of our red tails being chased out by the crows the other night. I was literally standing on our patio grilling uh, dinner and I heard the crows and I looked up and here comes the red tail hawk and here come the crows. So I run and grab the camera and I get the shot. <laughs> it happened that way, honest. But if you see a bald eagle on TV, it's almost always a red tail hawk sound they're using with it. Uh, we have these here in the winter. They are another bird that's nervous, impossible to see, never stops moving, and exceptionally difficult to photograph. But they have a unique call. Little tiny squeak. And I have it amplified here, so it's much softer. So it's a very, very subtle squeaking sound, and then they're around. But they're very small. They're, they're literally the, the smallest bird that we have next to the hummingbird. They're that small. Very happy to know that I have one of these behind our house for the first time in two years. Um, other areas in Legacy, if you live in wooded areas or where the, where we, the perimeters around the woods, you'll have wide-eyed vireos. They don't like to show themselves, but they like to call. And right now I have one in our backyard that I have not seen, but I know he's there. Very distinct call. So I'm hoping he appears and shows himself long enough I get a picture. This one was taken over in that place called the Villages. <laughs> but we have him here. Another fun bird. I was out walking on a Scrub J Trail one night, and of course I'm out and I'm full of dark mode. I've got the binoculars, I've got the camera, I've got the hat on, and I'm serious and somebody goes there's this bird that just keeps pecking the heck out of our tree we wish it wouldn't do that do you have any idea what it is and I, I look over in the tree and i knew exactly what it was by looking at the tree it was a yellow-bellied sapsucker if you have a tree in your yard or if you have a tree walking around that has all these little holes drilled in it that is what this bird does, is it taps into the, into the bark and then it fills with sap and they'll eat the sap, or better yet, the insects will get caught in the sap and they'll come back and eat the insects. Mm -hmm. But there's a couple of spots over on Scrub Jay that have trees that have been pecked out. And that's a, uh, a Chinese elm tree that it's on. And I see it on Chinese elms a lot, and they'll also do it on palm trees. I had never heard or seen a yellow-throated vireo in Legacy until about two weeks ago. And once again, a bird that 99% of us will never see, but they hide up in the trees and make a very pretty sound. And they'll sit, call, and make that sound. Little, little tiny vireo, like I said, but the chances of seeing one aren't very good. All right, that's the end of the presentation.
<laughs> they told you there'd be a quiz, right? No. No? no. You didn't tell them there was a quiz. Surprise. All right. All right. We're going to see if anybody stayed awake. How good of a job I did. All right. So that's one of the four birds. So how many votes do I have for Robin? How many votes do I have for Carolina Wren? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe? Okay. How many votes do I have for the assassin, the Cooper's Hawk? How about the Eastern Bluebird? How many votes? All right, you guys all get extra cold stars. That's the Bluebird. So here's the Waterbird. So we get a little tougher here. So is this the Wood Duck? Or the Anhanga? Or the great blue? Or the green heron? All right, I gotta start over and go back to the beginning. <laughs> no, it's the green heron. That's the chicken call of the green heron. Okay, we just covered this one, so there's a good chance that maybe. White-eyed Muriel, everybody? Yes? 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 Hint, 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 white-eyed Muriel? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> any, any guesses? Anybody travel outside the U.S., like to a place called Costa Rica? Anybody been there? That's actually what a toucan sounds like. Sorry, I had to throw something in. I had to throw a curveball. I had to throw a curveball. But that's literally what this toucan sounds like. And it gets to be annoying. But you'll hear it in the distance and it'll go on for hours. Okay, so how did I get to where I'm at? Well, I've taken pictures for years. And I had somebody tell me, you need to read this book. I go, why do I need to read this book? He says, because you like the garden, you like the landscape, and you like birds. And if you read this book, Bring Your Nature Home, it'll all make sense to you. And he was right. And it was one of the easiest to read, best, well-explained books about how wildlife, nature, and plants all work together and how to make them work together in terms we can all understand and not go deep into the weeds. If you want to spend the best $20 of your life, I'm serious, if you're a gardener, and if you like wildlife, and if you like birds, that book by Doug Tallamy explains everything. I'm serious, I've never met the man, I've read the book, I've given the book to friends, and then this is the follow-up he has called Nature's Best Hope. And if anybody likes to read, and if anybody wants to go through, I highly encourage either one of those books, because it, like I said, literally, it explains everything. And that goes back into the yard that I'm building for us over on Honeymoon. If you build it, they will come. <laughs> and now I have almost 72 species of birds that I've had in our yard in two years. So this is just my end slide, uh, giving credit where credit's due. All the photos were mine. Uh, I've pulled sounds off of a couple different spots on the web. I, I'm assuming they don't mind me using them, but I'm going to give credit where credit's due. Uh, I know some people are very much aware on your, on your smartphone, there's an app called Merlin. It's a free app. It works phenomenal. You can literally take the app and you can hit the button that says sound ID and hold it up and it'll tell you what kind of bird is singing. And it's, I'd say it's 98% accurate. It's very, very good. And it's a completely free app. It's called Merlin. I highly endorse it. Uh, it helps me out, especially when I'm traveling and I'm in an area and I'm hearing a bird that I haven't heard for a year because I haven't been there and I'm going, all right, I know what that is, but I forget what that is. And then they'll tell me what it is and then I know where to look. And that's it. That's all, folks. I'll <laughs> Sorry. Yes? Can you, not to tell us everything, but can you elaborate a little bit about what you did to your yard? I mean, are you 
feeding them? Are you, do you have bird baths? What, what, do you, what, are you doing? what did you do? I ripped out all of the non-native plants, which was all the plants in the yard. <laughs> <laughs> Everything. Everything's been removed with the exception of the Bahama, whatever, what you might call it, tree that's in the front yard, and I just haven't had the nerve to get it out yet. So I replaced all the non-native plants with native plants. That's step number one. I built a water feature in the backyard, and the water feature literally is designed for the birds. It's got a vault. Um, Trevor helped me with it. Um, put the liner in, and it recirculates the water in a naturalistic setting on the edge of our patio and it has the sound of water falling. So the birds want water, they want habitat, and they want food. When you have non-native plants in your yard, they're very pretty, but they don't have any food for what the birds want. Food is not limited to fruit, and it's not limited to seeds. All birds will feed their young insects as opposed to seeds. So you need to have plants that have insects on it so the birds can come remove those insects, specifically caterpillars, to feed their young. So if you have caterpillars, if you have water, and if you have shelter, you will have birds. As all the seeds go on the ground and then the, the uh, cranes come and then they poke at your lanai because they can't, I, all that stuff. Don't forget the squirrels. But yeah, well, I, I do have a couple bird feeders, and I have a couple ways that I use them. And yes, I have feeders for the seed. I don't put a lot out. I do know somebody that puts feed out for the cranes that we're not supposed to do. Mm -hmm. We won't mention any names. <laughs> yeah, we won't mention any names, but it, it, it is actually illegal in the state of Florida to feed sandhill cranes. That, that is a statute. But if you have feeders that are up off the ground and are neat and clean, you can get birds that like to come visit the feeders. Another way to have for, uh, feeders is a suet. And you'll get some birds that normally wouldn't come to a feeder will come feed off suet. So right now there's pine warblers and there's yellow-throated warblers that are coming through and they will come to a suet feeder. Um, if you're going to buy suet in a suet feeder, I uh, would get the peanut suet because it doesn't melt. And all the other ones make an icky, awful mess. But the peanut one doesn't melt. So, yes, we have feeders, but more importantly, we have habitat and we have water and we have shelter. Yes? Uh, regarding suet, where do you hang your suet? Because I put mine out and every night the raccoons <laughs> <laughs> and eat them all. So, I, you know, I stopped doing that. I, I have the very same problem, and I'm trying to figure out where to put it to keep the raccoons out. And right now, they haven't figured out where I've put it. But I actually, I actually, we lost, we had a big, huge, mature eastern redbud that we left, lost in that freak windstorm that came through about three weeks ago. So I save pieces of that, and I use it for props. And I've got pieces of it put in the ground behind our house. Uh, for the birds to come on and perch, and I actually have the suet feeder hanging from that. And it's fragile enough where the raccoon can't crawl up it and get get at it. So I'm assuming that's what's keeping him away. But we have the same raccoon problem. So the other thing I thought of doing was to run a wire from one point to another point and hang the feeder from a wire where the, where the raccoon can't get at it. But they're next to impossible to stop. <laughs> well, you may not want a, a dead piece of a tree stuck in the ground in your backyard. <laughs> but I, I, I tend to make perches to photograph birds on, and I haven't had any complaints yet, but I try to make something so there's a place that they can come and have shelter and rest, and I can photograph them. So it's kind of one when I give them water, and I want their picture. So. <laughs> Last year, I had a green kingfisher. Are they unusual to see? A green kingfisher would, if it's truly a, a small green kingfisher, would be very unique I, I, to see. I've seen it once. Yep. 
And I know it was because I had my binoculars. I'm yeah. like, what is that? You had, you had a nice prize. I've never seen yeah, one here. I was excited. I've only seen him in Costa Rica. How about that? Okay. <laughs> nice find. Yeah. How many sounds do the, the American crows make? Because I sat one day, I mean, they talked in different languages. <laughs> <laughs> They're they're a very highly intelligent they bird, were and I, so I, fascinating. between them and the blue jays, they can make almost an unlimited number of sounds. Yeah, because I mean, crows and blue jays are related. They're mm -hmm. they're both in the corvid family, so they they are a blue it's, jay and a, and a crow are are directly related. It was fun to listen to them because I mean they went from one language to another to another. I mean, and, and you knew they were doing calling different other ones in. But I was trying to see what they were doing. Any other questions? Yes. Do you put out any nest boxes? I have one bluebird nesting box that we've had this past season. Uh, I now have a second one that I'm going to put out this winter. And I have a great crested flycatcher house that I'm going to put out. And hopefully I'll catch something in one of those. But they're very... Um, the bluebirds like to come to the bluebird box uh, if you have the right habitat. Uh, if your yard is shaded and it's confined, they're not going to use it. But if you have an open area where they can fly in and fly out unobstructed, uh, chances are real good the blue, bluebirds will check it out. Yes? Do you use any specific food uh, when in your feeders? I know certain birds like certain... I usually buy a mix that's got millet and sunflower seed in it. And nobody likes to eat milo. So if you buy the cheap yeah. uh, seed at, you name the place, if you buy the cheap seed, it's going to be half milo. And nobody likes to eat milo other than maybe the squirrels. What about safflower? Safflower is okay, but it's the, it's the sunflower seeds you want and the millet you want. And cracked corn, they're, they're not very happen on crab corn either, although the, the cranes love it. So if you want to have cranes, get some crab corn. <laughs> but you're not supposed to feed them. You didn't hear it from me. Yeah. But you're, not, you're not supposed to feed them. Yes, sir? Yeah, does dried fruit in bird feed will work down here? It does up in Maine. Some, some, I've had mixed results with it. Um, in the winter months, you might have some birds that take, take you up on it. Uh, I've had a couple seed mixes that I've bought that had it, and I can't tell you if anybody's really gone after it. So it's hit and miss. I mean, you go to Costa Rica and all the bird feeders have fresh fruit and all the birds down there will eat fresh fruit. But here, you know, fresh fruit's going to last about a day before it turns into something yucky. But I mean, you can experiment, but I, I haven't done that because I haven't seen anybody here that really wants to eat it. Uh, up north, when we had Orioles up north, uh, the funnest thing to put out was grape jelly. And I know there are some people in Florida up north towards the Panhandle that will get uh, Orioles this time of year and they will go after the grape jelly. In Minnesota, I refer to it as uh, Oriole crack, <laughs> literally. And you go to Aldi and you buy the cheap grape jelly and you put it out and the Orioles can't stay away. It was literally a lot of fun to watch. But I haven't, like I said, the, the Orioles here are so infrequent that I, I wouldn't want to hazard trying to put that out. I mean, I would do anything to have Orioles in our yard here all the time, and you're just not going to have it. There's so few of them, and like I said, it's only the winter time. That's probably my favorite bird to have in the yard is the Oriole. Because he'll, he'll announce his presence as he comes in the yard, he'll tell everybody he's coming, he'll land, he'll get in the feeder, he'll eat, and he'll leave. And then in the when they have their young, they'll actually, both the male and the female will bring the young to the jelly feeder and feed them uh, grape jelly. It's hysterical to watch. <laughs> but you're only going to see that if you live up north. So, any other questions? Yes? Um, yeah, you had mentioned before um, some birds being particularly intelligent, so this may seem um, a strange question, but when I lived in Venice on the other, the other side, um, there was a female cardinal that no matter what I did, she kept flying into this plate glass window. I put up silhouettes of hawks, of everything that I could do. And 
she would do it and do it and do it and, and I, I just is she like particularly stupid? Or <laughs> why why would they keep doing something like that? She's trying to chase off a, uh, a competitor. I had a yellow-throated warbler do the very same thing, and they see themselves, and they don't recognize that it's oh. themselves in the window, and they're territorial, and they're trying to chase somebody else off. So even though there, there's a, a, like a hawk, that, that wouldn't, that wouldn't scare her away? She knows the hawk wasn't real. She's been there enough, and they're smart enough to know that. But they get territorial. I, um, for two or three days, I had a yellow-throated warbler going after himself in multiple windows in our house. And he'd come up the window and he'd tap on it, and then he'd... The cats thought it was hysterical. I mean, it was like <laughs> the best TV show they've ever seen. It was this yellow-throated warbler coming up. But you know, he wasn't hurting himself, but he literally was trying to chase off a competitor, you know. And if it happened to be the springtime, you know, maybe there's only one studly guy in the neighborhood, and she wanted to make certain that he paid attention to her. You know, it could be, but I would almost tell you with, with certainty that she was trying to, to defend a territory. Yes. Is there any magic remedy? Because I had the same thing, and, and we actually take bags over the window so you couldn't even have a reflection. And she kept, she didn't do it then, but as soon as we took the bags down, she was back. And the male sat in the tree and watched her. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've seen pe people use strings or streamers hanging down in front of the window. And I've heard that that works. And I only had the issue for two or three days in our house. And he's he's back out where he belongs on the feeder so I can take his picture. So he's a, the, the yellow-throated warbler is absolutely stunning. And it's one of... Definitely one of my favorite birds here in the wintertime to see when he shows up. He's absolutely gorgeous. So, anybody else? So, once again, I thank you for your attention and thank you for allowing me to do this. And, uh, if, if you see me out walking behind your house with the camera and pair of binoculars, I may be weird, but I'm not a weirdo. <laughs>